Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, let me see. Um, one thing I wanted to do first is, oh yeah. Do you know that there's a Pennsylvania Eagle camp? Do you know about this? So just Google, I don't know, Eagle Cam. There's a couple of eagles, uh, bald eagles that have babies every year. There's this live webcam, you can follow them and their babies growing up. Um, and it's really, really fascinating. So you could see, for example, you know, all kinds of stuff like raccoons attacking the nest and the parents protecting the babies from raccoons and all kinds of things like this. You could watch this all day. It's, it's very soothing. I highly recommend this. So check out the, the Eagle Camp. Okay, we can leave that for some other time. What I was hoping we would do today is the following. Um, I want to talk about this new time series analysis technique that is very, very powerful. Um, I want to get us a good understanding of this. I think we have a couple of papers illustrating this technique up for a presentation, and I have another example myself. So I was hoping we would just do that. We would go over these examples um, and learn about how to apply this technique, uh, this interrupted time series analysis technique. So what I'd like to do is maybe start with a very small, short introduction of so how this works. And then we will look at the two examples. I think Simon and Jenna, you're presenting something? Right, yeah. So we'll look at the two examples mid-lecture, and then we'll come back. And I have another example after that if we have time. So let's do that. So here's the idea, OK? So let's say you um, have longitudinal data, so over time, uh, of of measurements of all kinds of variables of interest, and you're interested in evaluating the effect of some particular intervention. So in this example here, uh, I'm showing you um, the Italian smoking ban from 2005. So back in 2005, Italy introduced this public smoking ban in all indoor public places. So apparently before then you could smoke in public indoor places in Italy. Uh, and after that, it became illegal to do so. Okay. Uh, and the reason they did this is to uh, try to protect the people who were in the same rooms in the same spaces as the people smoking, but were otherwise non-smokers themselves from potential uh, damage to their health of being exposed to the secondhand smoking, okay? So what you see here, um, oh, x-axis is time, and you see shaded this period uh, after 2005 when, uh, uh, after the ban uh, was, was enacted. And on the y-axis, you see measurements of, um, the number or rate, I think, of hospital admissions for acute coronary events okay? um, in Sicily. It's one of the Italian uh, regions. It's not the, for the entire country. It's a subset of the data. Okay, uh, So y-axis is number of these hospital admissions for acute coronary events for every 10,000, uh, I don't know, uh, inhabitants or whatever, population members in Sicily. Okay, so what does this tell you? What do you see? If I'm showing you this time series of these uh, health-related outcomes, what does this tell you about the intervention itself, the ban? Like your, your goal is to evaluate the effectiveness of this ban, if any. Um, I, I see there's a sudden job, uh, like right after the ban, uh, around 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes up again, kind of. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, one way to think about this is to reason about the trends over time. Um, oh, 
between the two segments. So we have one segment before the band and the second segment after the band or starting at the band. And you could think of um, identifying, visualizing, for example, linear trends for both of these segments. So I've shown that here uh, in, in the figure, um, a linear trend on the left-hand side for the period before the ban, uh, given those observations, uh, and a second linear trend for the period after the ban. Okay. Uh, of course, you can argue that a linear trend is, you know, not sufficiently uh, descriptive of this data. Maybe the relationship is not linear, and so on. That, that's all fine. Um, we could, you know, we could fit polynomials if you wanted. That's uh, a little bit besides the point. So now here's the um, the causal inference key idea. The key idea is that had it not been for this intervention for this ban you would have expected the trend before the intervention to continue in the same way as it was also after the intervention. So effectively, this dotted or dashed line you see here on the right-hand side is your counterfactual. It's whatever would have happened to the same people in Sicily had the ban simultaneously not been enacted. Okay, remember the discussion of counterfactuals from, I don't know, causal inference, um, causal relationships some lectures ago. So now the inference problem becomes measuring or estimating the difference between these two. Right? The bottom is whatever actually happened. This dashed line at, on the top is the counterfactual, is whatever would have happened, we expect would have happened. Right? And if there's some difference between these, then that's your effect size, if any. CJ. Yeah, I have a question. So if you look at like uh, around 2003, you can also see a drop there. So you cannot say that the drop happens after the ban, or, or in other words, ban happens before uh, the drop, right? So you, 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 we also have to show the precedence relationship. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, great, great. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. That's a good point. So, um, okay, yeah, two things. One is, I'm maybe slightly cheating with the visualization here because I'm showing you um, less history on the right-hand side after the ban compared to before the ban, right? So maybe I'm misleading you. Maybe, you know, if we would have looked at a couple more years on the right-hand side, the incidence of these acute coronary events would have gone up uh, just as it was before. So I'm sort of misleading you a little bit. That's fair. Um, so you can consider trimming the x-axis to reflect that um, so that we look at the same period. Uh, I think that's fair. Point number two, notice how um, there seems to be some seasonality in this uh, time series here. All right. So notice how, is my mouse, my cursor visible in the share? Yes. Okay, so notice how it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it's sort of like a sine wave almost. Okay, and here as well, it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up, right? So it seems just visually looking at this, that there's some seasonality in this. It seems like, you know, maybe this, the winter months, you get more of these things on average, the summer months, you get fewer of them, right? So maybe, you know, things like the flu and whatnot uh, confound this and make it worse. It's not just smoking by itself. Right, so um, the, the point though is, so let's say we, we look at the, um, the same period How about I annotate this? Draw the rectangle. Okay. 
So let's say we look at the same period now. We look at two years before, two years after, so that I'm not misleading you with this. Notice how um, there seem to be a lot more points above the linear trend line before than there are after. Right, so notice how, I don't know, about half of the points before are above the linear trend line, about half are below. If you look at the same trend line, right, continuing that same trend line, after the intervention, there's only this one point that's above the trend line. All of the other ones are below. So it does seem, even visually, it does seem, even controlling for seasonality, it does seem like there's slightly fewer of these. Would you agree? Right. So now the question is, you know, uh, we all know that we can't just do science based on um, visually interpreting figures. Uh, you won't fly with paper reviewers. So the question is, can we test this drop that we seem to be observing and hopefully agreeing on um, visually? Can we test this somewhat more formally with statistics uh, in a way that makes this claim that we're trying to make about the effectiveness of this ban um, more credible to reviewers and readers. So that's the topic for today's lecture and for these um, example papers that we're going to look at. Right, so how to do this uh, kind of um, testing. Okay, so let me There does not seem to be a way for me to do this. OK. Oh, interesting. So now I can't remove that thing. Clear all drawings. There we go. Excellent. Um, all right. So, so these are the kinds of questions that one can answer with some confidence with this technique that we're talking about today, right? So for example, how much did some intervention change an outcome of interest, if at all? How much did it change it immediately? How much did it change it over time? Did it change it instantly? Did it change it with some delay? Uh, was the change transient or did it sort of um, continue long-term and, and so on? Um, also importantly, very importantly, this framework that we're talking about today also allows one to reason about other factors than the intervention um, that may explain that change as well. So now, remember the three ingredients to establishing a causal relationship? Someone other than Bobo, who I think remembered. Someone with their camera off, let's see. I see cameras turning on. Is that Sam, Jayun? If you're with us, do you remember the three ingredients to a causal relationship? I guess Sam it is. Uh, one of them is um, uh, temporal precedence. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so what you claim to be the cause should be uh, should be put be before before the um, the effect. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is that um, uh, you we want to say that only the um, only the thing that you claim to be the cause uh, is res responsible for the for the effect, not mm -hmm. the other factors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the third one. That was good though. Thank you for the two. What was the third one? Someone else. I should make a test for the final, huh? Should have a final exam. Jenna says yes. I'd rather do a really, really, really good job on my project than take a final ex exam. Okay, I, we're, we're not going to have a final exam. What's the third one, Bobo? So I remember that uh, why it must be uh, the event must have a 
the outcome must happen, or the, the treatment must happen before the outcome. The second is there must be a correlation between the treatment or between the cause uh, and the outcome. And the third one is that there are no other alternative explanations for the outcome to change. Uh huh. Yeah. So the, the, the one that um, I think Sam forgot to mention is this correlation, the association between the cause and the effect. Right? So we need to establish that that thing exists. So th those are the three. So now go back to something like this. Temporal precedence is something we get for free here. So that's awesome, right? We, we get one for free just because of um, you know, not being able to travel in time. Right, and the fact that the data is longitudinal, right? So that's awesome. So now, if only we could establish the other two as much as possible, right? So some association between um, cause and effect, and some exclusion of plausible alternative alternative explanations. So uh, we turns out we can, you know, we can do most of this with with this framework. Right, we get the temporal presence for free, and we could do the other ones. In fact, if you think about it, we could have already done the other ones, the other two. We've talked about that at length over the last few lectures when we talked about this multiple regression framework. Right, that this multiple regression framework allows us to do exactly the other two. Right, we can establish a correlation between two variables, right, an x and an y. And we could do that while controlling for any kinds of other variables that we can measure, right? It still doesn't um, solve the problem of variables that could offer plausible alternative explanations that we cannot measure, right? We, we, can't, we can't solve that one, right? So that's not perfect, but it's pretty good, right? So, you know, a multiple regression gets you pretty close to, to doing this already. And now we have the third ingredient for free. We have temporal presence for free. So let's look at how we could actually implement something like this. Uh, it's sort of a very small, and I think you'll find intuitive extension of this linear regression framework that we talked about the last few weeks. Um, okay, so here, uh, here's a simple example. Um, let me further motivate why this is needed. So let's say, um, so here we have some um, artificial data set. You have, say, some variable representing time on the y-axis and some outcome variable artificial on the y-axis. And these are just the observations color-coded for before and after this hypothetical intervention that happened here at time equals 100. Okay. So now let's say you know these are the two trend lines, linear trend lines for these two periods before and after your hypothetical intervention. Um, and because this was artificial, I created this to illustrate this change in slope here uh, precisely. So now with any kind of bivariate analysis here, for example, a t-test that just looks at the two groups, a group of data points on the left-hand side before the intervention and a group of points on the right-hand side after the intervention. No, no bivariate analysis of any kind here, uh, looking at these two distributions would allow you to conclude that they're uh, any different, right? So this change in slope cannot be captured by any of these bivariate tests. So that's clearly, we, clearly we need something more. Um, here's an even more interesting one. Here we have, a change in level, you see the sudden drop, right? Right after the intervention, the slope itself did not change at all, but there was this huge drop in whatever hypothetical outcome variable we're measuring here at the intervention. And then the thing so continued as before, right? So this is another example of how uh, any kind of bivariate uh, test uh, would not be able to capture this change in level, right? So cle again, clearly we need something more. We can't, we can't do, uh, we can't capture any of these patterns with any kind of simple test like this. So here's where this segmented analysis comes in. Let me make this slightly smaller so I can also see. Okay, so we have essentially a few things that we care about, right? So we care about slopes. We care about how steep these trend lines are. Um, we care about them in segments. So we care about distinguishing between the before period and the after period. So essentially we care about two slopes here or how the first slope changes between the two periods. Um, and we also care about this change in level, 
right? As, uh, that happened right at the intervention. Right? So if only there was a way to model all of these things jointly uh, all at the same time and capture all of them uh, elegantly. It turns out there is, uh, I think one that you'll find very intuitive. So here's how, um, how easy you could do this. One, one very easy way of doing this. So let's say we create, or um, we've already created it, the, the X axis here, this variable um, that captures time is basically just a counter, right? I'm, I'm counting the whatever these are, months, days, time units, whatever they might be. I've just counted them from zero to 200 for in this artificial data set that I created. Okay, so I have a time counter. This is one of my variables, right? Um, I can further um, create a second time counter that sleeps for the entire first half here uh, and only starts ticking after the intervention. Right, so it's just you know zero. There's no doesn't do anything for the first half, and then starts ticking after the intervention. Okay. And finally, I'm creating this boolean flag that just indicates whether I've experienced or not the intervention already. Right. So at every time t, it tells me have I had the intervention already? Yes or no. Right, so this thing is false for the entire half, first half of this uh, time series, and then true for the entire second half. Okay, it doesn't do anything else. It's just a, a, a flag indicating if I've had the treatment already, yes or no. Okay, so three simple variables. So now here's what I'm doing I am um, regressing this outcome variable y on these three things, okay? So I'm, I'm specifying y as a linear combination of the three things I just mentioned, right? So there's some coefficient beta times time, uh, some coefficient gamma times this intervention variable and some coefficient delta times this time after intervention variable. It's just a basic linear regression specification that we've, we've seen all past lectures. Okay, I haven't done anything special here. So now here's the claim. Are okay, you ready? Are you sitting down for this? Yes. Okay, so the claim is that the coefficient estimates that I'm getting after estimating this regression, right, these beta and gammas and deltas are literally the things I wanted to model in the first place. Okay, so the, the slope that I wanted to capture, right, uh, for the first half before the intervention is literally this coefficient for time. The slope after the intervention turns out is the sum of these two coefficients. In other words, delta captures the change in slope after the intervention, right? Could be positive or negative. Uh, and this gamma um, coefficient captures the change in level, right? Positive or negative, it would be a jump, an increase or a drop. Okay, mind blown. Okay, these coefficients, the coefficient estimates, capture exactly this thing that I that I wanted. So. I'll, Probably you won't believe me, so I'll show you. So let's see. So here is, uh, we've seen this. This is the, um, the, first, the first part of this uh, discussion. Um, OK, so this is, let me start here. This is the same data set that I showed you on the slides. OK. Um, and what I've done is let me come back to this what i've done is i've created these three variables that i showed you on the slide okay so time is just x which i already had um intervention is just a boolean that tells me if time is above or below 100 essentially in this example uh and the second counter the counter that sleeps the first half 
uh, does exactly that. If, if time is greater than 100, then start ticking. Otherwise, sleep at zero. Okay, so they look like this. First thing, it just counts. Second thing is a Boolean, half false, half true. Third thing is zero for the first half and then starts ticking. Okay, so now I am estimating this linear regression, right? Y as a function of time, time after intervention and this intervention Boolean on this artificial data set. And I was claiming that the coefficient estimates for these three variables are exactly the things that I wanted. So look at that. The coefficient for time is the estimate is essentially one. Okay, so um, for every unit increase in time, I get one unit increase in the y variable in the outcome. So that tells you this is what? First diagonal. Okay, so if you remember how I created these, that's exactly what they are, right? So, you know, 50 with 50, 100 with 100, and so on. That's first diagonal. That's how I created the data in the first place. So I'm showing you that I can so reverse engineer this um, relationship that I artificially created in the first place. Okay, so. Coefficient for time is the slope before the intervention. This time after the intervention has a coefficient of minus 1.5. That's the change in slope, okay? Change in slope after the intervention. So I take the one, I take the first slope one, and I add the second slope minus one and a half. I get what? Minus half, okay, not a trick question. So I get a negative slope that is half as steep as the first one, okay, which is exactly how I created the data in the first place, right? So I'm showing you that I can actually, you know, reverse engineer that, okay? Um, and finally, the coefficient for this binary flag intervention going from false to true. So meaning going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, okay, gives me a jump in Y of about minus 50. Okay, so guess, guess what happened here? I went from about 100 to about 50 right after the intervention. Okay, so I changed my level with about minus 50. Okay, so how cool is that? Uh, so you've just you've just separated them into their own dimension. That's all you've done. Now it's two yeah. dimensional. That's all I've done. I've seg I've yeah. segmented this. Neat. So now tr trick question. Um, let me go back to go back to this. So I've used three variables here, right? I used two time counters. And a third dummy for the, um, just the um, intervention itself to do this. And I've shown you how to interpret them. Could you do this with fewer than three? Could you do the same with fewer than three variables? And, and if so, how? Somebody with their camera off. Anybody? Um, I, I guess you can take out like the insignificant terms. Uh, for example, uh, if the coefficient is small enough, uh, I guess you can just take out the entire expression associated with the term. But I guess so. Um, let me let, let me rephrase the question. I still want to be able to capture three things that are conceptually important to me, right? So I have two slopes. Or rather, you know, one slope and a change in slope relative to the first one, you know, however you want to think about it. But I have two slopes and I have a change in level 
around the intervention time. So I have so conceptually three things that I want to capture. And I'm asking, that's why I had three variables to capture the three things. And I'm showing you how the coefficient estimates map to the three things I wanted to capture conceptually. But now I'm asking, you know, given that I still want to capture the same three things, could I get away with fewer than three variables uh, while achieving the same thing? So your suggestion, Simon, I think makes sense in, in other contexts, but won't make sense here because these relationships still exist. So all of those uh, terms will still be significant. The relationships are real. You know, they're, they're real because I've artificially created them. They're real by construction. I know they're there. Uh, it's just a question of how can I discover them, right? So as you know, assuming I didn't know they were there, in this case, I'm cheating because I artificially created the data myself. But uh, normally you wanna test the hypothesis about, I don't know, the smoking ban, right? And you're not the one that actually generated that data in the first place, that created the data in the first place. Um, so um, in our example here, I know that these relationships exist. So therefore I know that all of these things are significant. I know the slopes are significant. Uh, I know the level drop is significant. I know all of this. Uh, so I can't take anything out in that sense. But how can I, how can I still get them? Should this be on the final? Jenna, what do you think? Should we add this question on the final? So, okay, so let me help you. Um, I don't know, some lectures ago, there were two magic M words that Bobo remembers. What were the two magic M words? That they had to do with causal relationships, but they both started with M, the letter M. What were they, Bobo? Oh, I don't realize you're asking me. It's moderator and the mediator. Aha, uh -huh. okay, okay, good. And we, uh, I don't know, a, a few lectures ago, we um, all agreed um, that there was a way to express one of the M words in this multiple regression um, framework. Do you remember how we did that? And, and which of the M words did we express in that regression? I think we use mod. I think we use time and to represent the moderator, right? Like uh, x times y. Like I mean, like we have two variables and we time them in the in the expression. Aha! Yeah, aha. the technical term. That's good, CJ. Thank you. The technical term for uh, multiplying the variables, or the domain-specific term for multiplying the variables in the regression, is interacting them. We've we're inter we've interacted two variables were added to this interaction term in the regression, okay? And that way we were able to capture this moderator relationship between those two variables that were interacting. And the interpretation of that, if you remember, was that um, the, say, say we have an X1 and an X2 interacting and, um, the way we interpret that is to say that the relationship between say X1 and the outcome variable Y, the strength of that relationship varies, changes, depending on the value of X2. So it's not a constant, but it depends on the value of X2. The relationship between X1 and Y depends on the value of X2. Or similarly, the relationship between X2 and Y depends on the value of X1. That, that was the interpretation of that interaction. And that's the reason why um, th that was uh, a way of representing this moderator relationship that uh, we uh, hypothesized between X1 and X2. Okay, so now um, 
question for the final exam is how could you, you know, could you specify an interaction term here between two variables that would allow you to capture all of these three constructs that we care about without the need for a third variable? Just the time interact with the intervention? Yes. Okay, so I challenge you to try this. I'm gonna give you um, this R script that I used as an example here. And um, I challenge you to try that to see um, if, you could, if you could do that. Or if you are um, so inclined, I will show you that here. Okay, so I've taken away the second counter, the one that sleeps the first half, and I've multiplied these two. I've added this interaction term between the other two. Okay. Um, oh, and I guess I can't run this for some reasons. Okay, so now I challenge you to interpret this interaction and see that it still captures the same three things that we care about. We care about these two slopes and the change in level. So meta point here is there's no single right way of, of doing this, right? So there's multiple ways of, of modeling this. I've shown you at least two, okay? All right. So let me, let me stop here with, with this part. Let's look at the two examples from, from Jenna and Simon, uh, and I'll have another one at the end. Uh, and I can stop sharing mine. Uh, do you have a preference of... Do you have a preference of if you go, who goes first, depending on the paper or anything? No, no, I'm happy with any order. And just focus on the time series analysis. There's probably more to both of those papers than, than just that. Ah, okay. Um, I guess I could just go first. Okay. If that's okay with you, Simon, unless you yeah, wanna. Okay. Okay, let me. Share my screen. Can everybody see the slides? Okay, let me put it in slideshow form. Okay, um, so I read the paper Adding Sparkle to Social Coding. Um, it's an empirical study of repository badges on the NPM ecosystem. Um, by some people you might know. And so let's get started. So uh, I kind of outlined the problem here. Basically, um, we have some, a little bit of insight in previous work that repository badges might be some really important signals on GitHub repositories uh, as far as like signaling qualities people want about their projects. But uh, the, the kind of the gap and the hook here in this paper was that we think repository badges are potentially really impactful features. And that's like this, uh, actually, wait, you can, which you can see the, not the slide notes, right? I see Again. all your notes and everything. I see the presenter view. Okay, yep, yep. Instead of yeah, the, okay. the other one, probably. Instead of the other one. Oops. Yeah. Right, I probably need to fix that. This should do it. You'd think I have enough practice with this. <laughs> um, Looks good now. OK. Uh, resume slide now. I have now lost my like presenter view, but I think that's fine. I don't really need that. Um, OK. 
Uh, so it was like this last statement is the most important part, I think. Uh, and that's really that badges are potentially impactful features in these uh, social coding environments. However, uh, before this paper, the values and effects of those badges aren't haven't been very well understood. And so the goal of this paper was to to try to understand them and they do that using mixed methods, um, but before I get there, the main research questions that they were trying to answer were, what are the most common badges and what does displaying them intend to signal? And to what degree do badges correlate with qualities that developers expect? And we'll see kind of examples of what they mean in a couple in the future slides. Um, and so they, like I said, they, for the methods they actually use to answer these questions, they applied mixed method, methods in particular. The first research question, they conducted two online survey, surveys uh, targeting package maintainers and corresponding contributors for NPM packages. And they were trying to, to answer question one, because um, that's really trying to understand like what badges they use and why. <laughs> and then, um, the second thing they also did was uh, they did repository mining to actually uh, gather data on the frequency and historical adoption of badges among all the packages, uh, specifically <laughs> a, a large number of them. Um, and that was like collecting their data set to then do answer research question two, which is what we'll focus on because that's when they started doing their building regression models to test hypotheses, and they actually use the surveys to generate hypotheses. Um, so I have the full list in my slides of hypotheses that they generated from research question one, but um, I mostly just want to focus your attention on uh, hypothesis four, because uh, that's going to be the example Kind of domain and answering that like testing the hypothesis in the the time series analysis that i'll talk about in the next couple slides or the next the following slides so um hypothesis four is what they they i'm using as an example of what they're testing with all of their regression models and that just says is is hypothesizing that the adoption of dependency management badges correlates with fresher dependencies and so um, since they're testing the quality of pressure dependencies, they actually have to define a metric of what freshness of dependencies is. And uh, I think I talk about that briefly in the next couple of slides. Um, right, and so for testing each hypothesis, they actually take three steps. Now I actually talk about all three of them, but I think if we're talking only about the time series, it'll be the the last step, uh, the third step. But um, the first one they do do is they look for correlations um, between the presence of badges and difference in the quality that they are signaling, independent of causal relationships, confounds, and historic trends. Um, and they use a specific technique that I've highlighted here for that. Um, they also call it additional information, but uh, the next thing they do uh to analyze the hypothesis is explore whether badges add info to explain the qualities beyond readily available signals because beyond badges repositories have all these other kind of signals about them that might actually explain uh the quality rather than just the the badges uh so here they're trying to test whether the badges add extra info um, and to do that they use uh hierarchical linear, linear regression not unlike Kind of what we did in our homework um, and they also do a model fit in diagnostics like the ones we did in the homework so actually what they do with the linear regression is they come up with a base model that only has these read readily available signals and then they also have a full model which they compare it to in terms of fit and diagnostics that have the badge predictors so they can really see if the badges are adding anything and then finally the most interesting for what we're learning about today is they do a longitudinal analysis. Um, it says one on my slides instead of three, but the last thing they do is a longitudinal analysis, which reveals whether introducing a first badge has an observable effect on the package's quality as the package evolves. And so they use a time series regression, discontinuity design, which they call RDD, and multiple regression to study that. 
Um, I'm probably going to skip over my information about RDD since it's basically what Bogdan just explained in the mini lecture. Um, but in this domain, so that's like the first two points here, but in this domain, um, they call the earliest display of a badge as the intervention. And then they actually look at nine month trends before and after the addition of a badge to um, in their analysis to explore the impact the badge has on the trends before and after the intervention, which would be the introduction of the badge. Um, and then they use multiple regression to estimate the trend in response before the badge adoption. So the time variable and the changes in level, which is the intervention variable and the trend after the badge adoption, which is the time after intervention. And uh, in doing so, they also control for all the other things they need to control for. I won't get into those details. Um, now to the actual example, which I think will give you better context uh, is, well, like I said, the response variable in their, their regression analyses will be the dependency freshness, which they compute um, kind of using the model that dependency managers actually compute. It's just some like numeric score based on to, to indicate how many of the dependencies in a package have newer versions at the time that they were looking at. And then to reiterate some of the hypotheses they're testing in uh, the actual like statistical framing would be that they want to see if dependency manager badges correlate with more up-to-date secure dependencies oper operationalized with the freshness metric. And they also expect a marginal effect from information related badges. Okay, so I do talk about some of the correlation, but I'm going to skip that since we want to get to the time series stuff. Um, although I'm not checking chat, so let me see. Oh, no worries. We're sort of gossiping in the background, but um, okay. Nothing to address. <laughs> okay, I was like, because I can go over the longitudinal stuff, but I, I think that you want me to get to, or I mean, the additional information regression analysis, like comparing the base and the full model and correlation. No, I, I think the time series is more relevant for today. Okay. Um, so they first actually start, instead of doing the, the regression analysis, they actually create these, which I thought they were really nice, um, kind of they call it like some longitudinal freshness data plotted um, before actually doing the regression analysis. And this was like the outcome of that for dependency management. Um, and so you can kind of see before the freshness is a lot higher. And then once they introduce the, the badge for um, dependency management, the freshness increases so you, you can actually see the start to see the trend that um, the adoption of particularly on the left here the dependency manager badge results in improvement of freshness of dependencies um, and then it it kind of uh, starts to deprecate after a while but the actual badge itself uh, introducing the badge actually increased the freshness of dependencies um, and in fact, on the, the right is just for all information badges. It turns out there is actually a slight trend um, just in these graphs on uh, like any badge being introduced, it has an effect on the, the freshness of the dependencies in a similar trend to the one on the right, just not as, sign not as significant. And so to actually confirm the trend they did, and that the results are going to be on the most right here, the actual regression analysis and more specific numbers is that the adoption of any badges still correlates to a strong improvement in freshness. And they found out it's about a factor of 2.5 on average. And how they actually interpreted this um, was from the coefficient on intervention here uh, from 0 0.93 and they raised because they logged it they rose it uh, they natural logged it so they had to raise it to uh, like the power of e well that was the power on the e and because it's negative here and you can see where I'm pointing with my mouse right okay 
Um, I was banking on that. <laughs> um, so you can see that it decreases. And so that means there's an improvement in freshness because um, you want your dependencies to be fresher. Um, and it, it's about uh, a factor of 2.5. And then uh, you can also start to see using some of the other coefficients for like time and time after intervention that adoption slightly decays over time. Because uh, the intervention actually, like it's, it shows that there's an improvement in freshmen, but the time and especially time after intervention is a positive coefficient, meaning that uh, it's gonna slightly decay after, after the intervention. Uh, and then last, I have some threats to validity. Um, first is the imperfect measures, specifically with oper operational, operational measures, um, because like freshness isn't the only measure you could use to describe uh, dependency, like good to dependency management. Uh, there's other metrics you could use. Uh, they they use test suites as an example. Is just because you have large test suites doesn't mean that you have good testing practices. So that's something that could be can seriously affect like the the results of their models, especially even the the longitudinal one. And then um, one thing that their study generally cannot do is distinguish between the effects of practice adoption from effects of badge adoption. And so they can only interpret the results as exploring the liability of the signal that a badge provides and nothing more. Um, and then they also don't really look at causal, causal relationships between badges and the study qualities. Um, none of the analysis analyses that they do uh, allow that. And so those were the threat stability. That's all I have, but I'll go back to this because I feel like that's probably something we would want to talk mostly about. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any thoughts, comments? Just want to make sure I understand the context. Is badge something that developers can just add themselves or that they have to be authenticated in some way? Oh, badges? Yeah. I don't think that they need to be authenticated on GitHub. I think that they, and actually, I think that was one of the things uh, that added to their limitation from my understanding in the badges versus practices. I kind of didn't really understand the sentence at first, but um, it, it, it's kind of related to the fact that they don't actually look at the values of the badges themselves, just that the va va badges kind of exist and were there. Um, so like their code, co for example, for code coverage badges, you could have like really bad code coverage and they don't actually look at the value of that code coverage. Um, but yeah, this kind of gets off your point. Uh, no, they're not, you can have the badge there and it could have actually bad values. Um, no one validates that the, <laughs> the badge is actually um, adhered to. I don't think in the paper when they did the mining, I didn't read a whole lot into the mining, but I don't know that they actually confirmed whether the, the actual code base adheres to the badge in such a way that like the badge can be ass assessed. Like, like for code coverage, it's easy because you usually use like CI or something like that to get the numbers from that. But there's some code, ba like some badges uh, that I guess are more qualitative that would need to, to kind of confirm it would probably need some like analysis on the actual code base and some kind of computational metric to kind of really see whether that they're adhering to it and and that has it kind of gets back to imperfect measures can you really like what's the right way to calculate those kind of things to to assess whether the badge is actually like adhered to properly 
I think I feel like badges are really like you're just trusting the developers to use them correctly. <laughs> There's, there's something else I want to focus on um, uh, here that's also important. So if uh, could you show that plot again, the um, uh, trend lines? Huh? Yeah, this one, yep. So This plot was really cool, by the way. Th thanks. Could you say again what each of those like, points are? Kind of what, what goes in the plot? Say, you know, the left-hand side one or something. Um, so I'm... I'm not quite sure like how it's computed as far as like I just read in the text that said longitud longitudinal freshness data and that's what they plotted on the x-axis. Um, freshness like their freshness metric um, is plotted on the the y-axis but I, I didn't I guess it's month index relative to badge. So like the X axis is like the nine months around the introduction, but I, I'm not really sure like how they get, I'm guessing the freshness data, there's something in here compared to the longitude. Can you talk about it? Cause I, I didn't really read that much into the paper to kind of get how they computed the, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So let me say something about this because there's some uh, deeper insight here that I want to highlight. Um, so every um, the, the unit of analysis is one package or one of these open source projects. We you know, a package is a project in in this study. And the unit is one package or one project, and every one project or package is observed eighteen times. Right is observed monthly, eighteen times around the time of this intervention, which we call the adoption of that particular badge. Right? So for every package or project, we have data on when they adopted that badge. That's the purple thing there, and we call that month zero. And then we observe that project or package nine months before and after this intervention. Okay. So every package contributes 18 data points to, to this, right? Nine before, nine after. Oh, okay, right. That makes sense. Okay. And the whatever the, the data points are the values of this freshness metric lower is better here so that's how you read the, the chart it's a reverse coded in hindsight that was uh, a mistake we should have coded it more intuitively, but lower is better as opposed to higher is better it's, it's um, maybe confusing in that way, but so okay so now. Um, here's a really, really important thing. So in the previous example, the um, what do we have? The smoking in Sicily example, the one I started lecture with. Okay, um, we had essentially only one time series, right? We had however many data points, uh, values of that outcome measure, before and after the smoking ban, right? But one, one time series. Okay, one intervention, the smoking ban, and one time series with however many values we had there. Here, we have essentially um, one time series consisting of these 18 data points for every package in the sample. And there's however many packages in the sample, many, right? Tens of thousands or something. Okay, so here's the catch. The catch is, as opposed to that um, example at the beginning of class and this one here, every package in our sample, every project in the sample probably adopted the badge or experienced the intervention at different times, right? It's not a global thing. It's whenever they decide to start using it. You know, maybe there's some packages that decided to start using it at the same time coincidentally. But by and large, right, we have no, you know, it could be any time, right? This is over a long period of observation and they could have adopted this at any time, okay? 
So um, essentially, but, be, but because they all experienced this intervention and the intervention was the same for all of them, the, the adoption of this respective badge, that allows us to um, align all of these time series on the zero point, right? The time, the month when they experienced the intervention. Okay, for every package, we can align their time series on zero, and then we can overlay them. So what you see here is instead of individual data points, like in that smoking example from um, the beginning of class, um, you see distributions of data points. So every one of these box plots is a summary of the distribution of data points for that particular month across all of the projects or packages. Okay, and you see the uh, solid line and the box plot in the middle, middle there is the median of those distributions to kind of give you a sense of overall trend across the entire sample. Okay, so now this is actually, um, this is actually really important from a study design point of view. So um, there's something, there's something I said in the beginning of class today, I said that that this technique, this interrupted time series analysis technique is, is very strong and powerful as far as making causal claims goes because it gets you temporal precedence for free um, and because it sort of gets you the other two by using this multiple regression formulation where you can add covariates and so on and control for things. Okay, so now here's, here's a catch, right? By construction, with a technique like this, so if, if we go back to um, the smoking example I started with, right? we do observe that change in trend. We see that there's fewer people hospitalized with whatever uh, that thing was, coronary events after the smoking ban compared to before. We, we do see that, but we are not sure if it's really because of the smoking ban or because of something else that happened at the same time. Okay, so that's really important, right? It's a huge threat to um, validity. If we're looking to make causal claims, if we wanna attribute the decrease in acute coronary events to the smoking ban, we have to make sure that we have excluded all plausible alternative explanations as per Sam earlier, right? And for example, you know, what if, it, what if it's something else that changed around the same time? Maybe, um, I don't know, access to healthcare changed uh, policy-wise policy or something, cost of healthcare uh, changed, uh, you know, nationwide or whatever, like, so, so some other, a thing that sort of fundamentally changed something that would have caused that same effect, right? We, we just can't know, we can't know. We can't know if it's the thing we're looking at or something else that happened at the same time, right? Unless we can measure that something else that happened at the same time and control for it in the regression, for example. We can adjust for that. But you know, let's say we can't measure it. So now here's why this design here and, and this study is actually quite clever. It's because, um, so remember every package, right? They, they've been selected as all having experienced the same intervention, the adoption of this badge. But really importantly, they've probably all um, experienced the intervention at different times. They didn't all experience it at the same time They, you know, because they choose whenever they want to adopt this. So now, you know, if you have these plausible alternative explanations, right, something that happened at the same time as the intervention that could have explained the effect, which is something we could not have excluded with the first example, the smoking ban, okay? This uh, threat to validity pretty much disappears with a design like this because we align on this intervention date across many individuals. And you know, you'd be really, really, really unlucky, right? It's like they, all of these individuals or projects would have had to all experience this alternative explanation, this alternative cause 
at the same time as the actual intervention, right? Even if their actual interventions were at random times, right? So really unlikely. So in that sense, right, a design like this, where you can sort of align across individuals on this intervention date, pretty much, so th this becomes much closer to um, this benefit you get with random assignment in a true experiment, right? Because these plausible alternative explanations more or less go away in the aggregate, right? Because they couldn't all have happened all at the same time as the real intervention across all of these packages. It's just, it's just really unlikely, right? Does that make sense? So this is, um, this is one very clever, I think, um, study design choice, right? That just, just by the nature of this data that we were modeling, where we were able to do that. Um, but that's something that, that makes uh, something like this stronger, right? Than, than in the smoking ban example. Right, the fact that these interventions have happened at random times across the sample and that we can align on this intervention date pretty much removes confounding effects like that. So that's the, that's the one thing I wanted to highlight here. Um, so, so but, uh, I have a question. So I'm thinking it is also possible that this intervention will cause something else and something else cause it. So, so for example, like if, uh, if a project has kind of add a new badge and then it will likely be to searched by when you like we will search in GitHub, right? For example, it will sort the projects with badges first and then this will maybe cause uh, like more downloads, right? So in this case, these two, it's kind of these two interventions will always happen together. Yeah, so I think I, I, you're right. So I think if you have, if you can articulate a mechanism that would constitute a plausible alternative explanation, right, the threat remains. I'm not saying, you know, and this is why you saw that threat to validity um, in the, the slide Jenna mentioned uh, about not being too bold in our attempt to make causal claims. Right, because of things like this, um, I don't know that I that I have one so to your uh, specific point. So, I mean, uh, unless you can convince me that there is this mechanism. So, for example, the one you you mentioned, you know, I don't know if that's a real mechanism. I don't know if GitHub sorts by badges, right? So, you know, th that one specifically is probably not a valid criticism. But I think the the deeper point you're making is, you know, what what if there is, right? What if there is this. Um, thing that happened at the same time um that you know so happens consistently at the time of the intervention right so you and and you can't exclude that right so that i i think you're right and that's why we're not really making fully causal claims here either right we're saying you know th th we're getting closer but we're not confident enough to to do that without a randomized control trial a true experiment but we're saying this is more confidence than you would get typically with an observational study, I think is what I'm trying to say. Shoot. Simon, do you wanna go next? Do, do, do you have more thoughts on this one? Anyone else? All right. Uh, then let me share my screen real quick. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, so yeah, so good afternoon everyone. So today, uh, I'll be introducing the segmented uh, regression analysis of interrupted time series studies in medication use research. Um, so it's going to be a little bit repetitive. Uh, so like, so, so to recap the paper, um, it really put a heavy emphasis on the analysis method um, and the, the methodology uh, instead of you know exploring like specific research questions. Um, so it's, it's more like an exploratory work. Um, 
Uh, so, uh, so uh, Bogdan already introduced this. So uh, interrupted time series is a stat statistical analysis method involving tracking long-term period before and after the point of intervention to assess the intervention's effect. And uh, it's a quasi-experimental time series analysis since it's not controlling all the external factors, uh, but it does allow comparison to the control group uh, as I demonstrate later. Um, so, so it is widely used in a variety of disciplines, for example, political science, measure the impact of changes in laws uh, on the behavior of people, economics, sociology, et cetera. And this paper introduced a case uh, where the analysis is used in the field of medication. Um, so, okay, so uh, I'll just introduce the two requirements for a segmented uh, regression analysis. It requires a sufficient number of time points before and after the intervention and it requires data to be collected over time and organized at equally space intervals. Um, so, so, so the paper pr provided a running example. Uh, so this graph shows uh, the time series um, of the mean number of dispensed prescription per patient per month in the cohort of 860 New Hampshire um, Medicaid program participants. Uh, who re uh, received an average of uh, three drugs, uh, three or more drugs per month in the baseline year. Um, so yeah, it's worth noting that um, this method really takes the average of all the patient's data points at that month. Uh, and the intervention, uh, as you can see in the graph, started uh, about 20 months into the uh, observational time, uh, September 1981. And uh, they actually restricted the number of pre uh, prescriptions reimbursed to a max of three per patient per month. Uh, and we can see clearly from, from this time series, there's a peak right before the restriction and uh, uh, right before the restriction started and it dropped significantly afterwards. Um, so, um, so the question they coined was like, is, is, the, is this change in the level and trend uh, uh, of, of the result uh, is by chance alone, or there are other factors other than intervention. Um, so this is where uh, segmented regression analysis comes into play. Um, so uh, it's similar to the uh, Italian smoking ban um, problem. So uh, this is the, they call this the full model. Uh, so they started with this uh, regression um, so basically, the same thing. So the time would be the time since start intervention is the in the in, is the boolean variable that indicates whether the intervention has proceeded. Uh, there's time after intervention, which is the number of months after intervention. There's error term and yt is the uh, predicted term, uh, the the mean number of prescriptions per patient per month. Um, these are the coefficients, uh, the baseline level, baseline trend level change and trend change. So um, this is the, the fitting of the data. So um, the um, so it's worth pointing out three variable, uh, three um, things here. So look at, uh, so if you look at the p-value for the baseline trend uh, beta one, uh, it's about 61%. Uh, so remember the p-value is the evidence uh, against null hypothesis. So like there is a 61.28% chance that the baseline trend is just like random. Um, and uh, so so th this is, okay, so they actually have two models. The, so the table, like the, the A is the full model and B is the, uh, they call it a par parsimonious segmented regression model. So the way they kind of simplified this model is by taking out the coefficient that's insignificant. They call it insignificant terms. Um, so so beta one is 0 0.003 and uh, beta three is 0 0.02. So they are deemed insignificant and they take out the term and like refit the model in the updated uh, they refit the data in the updated model to get the parsimonious, uh, which is basically simplified uh, regression model. Um, so, um, so to, um, the, they introduced two ways to report the inter, uh, intervention effect. You can 
uh, just use the um, beta two, uh, as we can see. So the average number of pres prescriptions dropped by 2.6, or you can use the, the percentage based on the baseline trend, uh, which is about like decreased by uh, 46%. Um, the paper also introduced multiple interventions. Uh, so it is pretty simple. You just simply uh, increase the number of coefficients um, and uh, introduce in intervention two, uh, which is the uh, indicator for the uh, intervention, uh, the second intervention and the time after an intervention two. Um, so also there's the, this lagged effect, uh, which the author pointed out, is basically the effect of interventions um, like usually takes time to manifest and this delay, this transition period of the intervention is the, kind of the lagged effect, um, the result of the lagged effect. Uh, so this graph shows that after uh, like the patient uh, withdrawal, the ineffective drugs, there was a brief transition period of two to three months in the shaded region until the patient were replaced on the substitute medication. Um, so um, uh, let's see. So, so how to manage this transition period? Uh, so the author suggests that you can either exclude the data from the transition period in the time series analysis or model the period as a separate uh, segment if there are enough data to analyze. Um, there's also this autocorrelation, which is kind of, kind of similar to collinearity. Um, so basically, uh, so instead of correlating between the independent variables, it happens between two periods of times in the time series. Uh, sometimes it can just happen in a regular pattern, such as seasonal pattern uh, in a monthly time series, uh, in the case of prescriptions, where prescribing in January of one year is more similar to prescribing in uh, January a year ago uh, than prescribing other month. Um, so to detect it, it's, uh, you can use software um, or visual inspection, uh, which we kind of introduced in class uh, using uh, residuals versus time plot. If there's no pattern, there's no autocorrelation. There's a pattern. Uh, it has an autocorrelation. Um, so if we fail to consider this autocorrelation, we may underestimate the standard errors or overestimate the significance of the effect of intervention. Um, so there's also uh, the wild data points, uh, basically the outliers. Um, in, in the case of the uh, Medicaid participants, uh, we have a peak right before the uh, intervention, they call it anticipatory demand. Um, so th there are different reasons uh, for this. So for the anticipatory demand, is something that can explain. They're also uh, caused by measurement errors, uh, some caused by random variation. Um, so in terms of the uh, random variation, you can carry out the analysis with or without the wild data points to evaluate its impact. Um, so, so there are also uh, bias control. So um, the, the sources of biases can be caused by co-interventions, which is basically there are two interventions happening at the same time, seasonal changes um, that occurs at the time of intervention. Uh, there could be changes in the composition of the study population or changes in measurement. Um, so to, to mitigate biases, uh, um, the author suggests that using a control group. Uh, so for example, in this case um, is the uh, percentage in uh, nursing home admissions versus the time and uh, the, the solid one is uh, in New Hampshire and the control group, which is kind of gray, uh, is the New Jersey uh, nursing homes. Uh, so um, by comparing, so, so we can uh, mitigate it by comparing the effect uh, in the intervention group with that in the control group, mm -hmm. it separates the intervention effect uh, from others that may have occurred at the same time, uh, the author argues. Um, so this is another one. Uh, it's basically a similar effect, but this is more complicated. So this this time series is um, the pain reliever prescription versus the month. So there are two uh, two interventions: the introduction of 
uh, Zoom Prac, uh, which is a type of pain reliever, and the withdrawal of it from the market. Uh, so um, we can use the typical analysis of the outcome using non uh, Zoom Prac as the control group, uh, non Zoom Prac pres prescriptions as the control group, and say that the independent this is independent from the intervention. However, uh, it may also be the case that with the introduction of the Zoom Prac, the prescription of it becomes so popular that it reduces the prescription of the non Zoom Prac drugs. And with the withdrawal of it, the prescription uh, of the non Zoom Prac drugs skyrocketed. So this makes things more complicated. And the author argued that this is still a, a accepted methodology design, um, but it should be addressed in the threat to internal validity. Um, so there's also stratification, which basically is, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so like they, they gave the case that when a policy encourages prescribing of less costly uh, drug instead of other ones within the health network, the outcome of this policy may depends on the physician's incentive to change prescribing pattern, which is heavily depends on their contract with the health network. So this is called stratification. Uh, to mitigate its, this effect, the author recommends have separate models, one for uh, the physicians as a staff model, another for the, the prescription of the physician to the patients that are for, uh, from each physicians. Um, so, uh, both the okay, the author also argues that both the full and the most uh, parsimonious models will not correctly estimate the effect of the intervention if the confounders exist, uh, and their important measured confounders should uh, should be added to the model regardless of statistical significance, such as the baseline trend, which is an important control variable for secular trends. Um, so at the end, oh, okay, so these are the last two slides. Um, the author summarized the strengths and the weaknesses. The strength is um, of the segmented regression analysis allows an al uh, analysts to control for pre prior trends in the outcome and to study the dynamics of change re in response to intervention. Um, it addresses uh, important threats, internal validity, um, even without the control group. Um, it estimates changes in the trend of effect over time, and it can visually display the dynamics of response intervention, either delayed, abrupt, uh, abrupt or gradual, uh, either persistent or temporary. Um, the weakness is that it doesn't support nonlinear patterns. Um, the author argues uh, you can deploy the Box Jenkins model, but it requires at least uh, 50 uh, time points, which medication use uh, research lacks. Uh, and also it doesn't allow control for individual level covariates, uh, for example, um, in the New Hampshire Medicaid uh, participants case, um, the uh, hospital simply takes the average instead of having individual level information and is kind of the opposite to cross-section analysis methods. Um, so um, yeah, that's it for the presentation. Cool. We're, since we're out of time, let me just say one more thing before um, before ending this, uh, th thanks a lot, Simon, for the presentation. This was this was useful. The the one thing one thing uh, I want to tell you before we go is um, so there were two really deep insights in this paper that Simon just presented, um, and uh, if you actually if you look at the slide deck, um, th there's this remaining example of. Um, the stand your ground um, change to legislation in Florida and sort of the impact on homicide rates there uh, as a result of this. There's this extra example we didn't get to talk about, but you can read about in the slide deck that um, illustrates these points really well. Um, there's also a bunch of readings that I posted in the Google Drive folder under interrupted time series that give you more context and information about these. But the two really deep insights that Sam's paper sorry, Simon's paper illustrated um, are the following, and they're really important. One is um, this issue of autocorrelation. So remember, I kept complaining the last many lectures about how um, 
these data points in a regression model need to be independent observations. And you know, if they're not, if if you're violating this not independence assumption, then you sort of have to do something special. You can't just go on with your life uh, like normal. So you know, by construction, these time series points kind of violate that, right? Because points closer in time are more likely to be close together in, in values of these variables than points farther away in time, right? So they're non-independent in that way. Uh, and in the readings, you'll find a whole bunch of ways to deal with this, but this is really, really important. The second thing that Simon's paper mentioned that is equally important is that um, you can be more confident in the claims you're making about these causal effects if you have a control group where you could study the same problem and you have similar time series um, and compare the effect in the group you're studying to the lack of an effect ideally in this control group. So you'll see in this uh, Florida example how the authors had this um, control group of a few comparison states uh, that were otherwise similar um, but did not experience that same effect. So they were much more confident that the effect was really due to this change in legislation rather than other things that may have happened coincidentally around the same time. So these are the two really deep insights. One is about so how to deal with autocorrelation and some of these issues. And the second is about control groups. Uh, and you have readings and the drive folder that illustrate all of these in, in great detail. And I'm happy to answer more questions next time, but uh, you know, we're already out of time now. So I'll, I'll just stop here. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>